Alrighty, we spend a lot of time on this channel talking about the most fancy or popular bikes out on the market. I mean, we do have an RS660, a Trident 660, and a Rebel 1100 in the shop right now, but today we're going to talk about seven motorcycles you probably forgot even existed. Not me though, I remember everything. I see all and I'm watching you right now. By the way, you really should stop picking your nose, Brandon, that's just kind of gross. Anyways, these seven bikes are all from the last decade, and while a couple of them are out of production, all of them are great choices in their segment. We've got modern classics, cruisers, sport tourers, and even hypernakeds, because yes, there is one hypernaked you've forgotten about, and you're hurting its feelings. Now, just in case you're wondering what we're using to consider something as overrated, we're basically conducting a popularity contest. We're comparing the numbers of videos from motovloggers, motorcycle media companies, and even some articles since we don't actually have any hard sales figures. I'm sure you've got a whole bunch of bikes you think should be on the list, so let me know down below and maybe we'll have enough to do a part two powered by the commenters. Let's dive right in today with number seven, the Kawasaki Z900. Not the RS version, which we simp for all the time, the plain Jane Z900. This bike is swimming with some serious Seriously big fish competing against the likes of the MT-09, the Street Triple, the Duke 890, the Jixxas 750, and the Ducati Monster. The best way to describe the Z900's place in the motorcycle space is always a bridesmaid, never a bride. The bike is always the, I like it a lot, but motorcycle in the lineup of intermediate naked bikes, and I really don't get it. It's packing a 948cc, inline 4, putting down 125 horsepower and a whopping 73 foot-pounds of torque, making it one of the torquiest bikes in the segment. It's a little bit porky at 463 pounds wet, but it's still a wheelie happy bike. We did a whole lot of So You Want a Blank Bike video on this one, which you definitely check check out, but long story short, it's a budget bike without budget components. Kawasaki has set themselves up as the brand where you get everything you want with none of the extra frills you'd barely use, and then they come in crazy cheap. The Z900 costs just $8,999, and with it you get a TFT dash that looks like just like one off the ZH2, rebound and preload adjustable suspension, assisted in slipper clutch and rider modes. What more could you really want from your naked bike? Does it have Brembos? No, but it doesn't really need it. Hydraulic clutch? Nah, cable's just fine. It's a motorcycle, and unfortunately, the 900-ish CC displacement naked bike world is favoring a lot of technology and features, both of which add a lot to the MSRP, but trust me, you're not going to notice when you're ripping around on this bike. You know what else is underrated? Having a comm system on your helmet while you ride. Listening to nothing but the sound of your engine for an entire ride gets boring fast. Thankfully, Cardo makes some of the best in-class comm system you can get for your motorcycle. You can listen to music, chat with your buddies, and listen to the sultry sounds of my voice all on the go. Just don't do that last one. You really Really shouldn't watch YouTube videos while you ride. Everyone on the Yammy Noob team uses Cardo communicators and without them we wouldn't be able to film our dual vlogs. Click that link down below and get your hands on the best motorcycle comm system money can buy. Number two, let's switch from naked bikes to neo retro or modern classic bikes, and our pick for this one goes to the Moto Goosey Grizo, a bike so underrated I first learned about its existence from a Discord boy on the Yamcast. The Grizo came out in 2006, and it was getting a solid buzz until the mid 20 teens when Goosey decided that making a thousand versions of the V7 bobber was more fun than a weird V twin naked bike. It was packing an 1151cc overhead valve longitudinally mounted air cooled V twin. Man, that's a lot of descriptors crammed into one sentence. This is probably why it didn't get any coverage. People didn't want to type all that crap out. And I sure as hell don't want to say it. The engine put down 108 horsepower and 80 foot pounds of torque and weighed it at a little over 500 pounds ready to ride. Part of the reason the Grizo fell by the wayside was because BMW dropped the R9T line of bikes and the Grizo was written off as a copycat, even though it was around first. The best part about the Grizo was that while it was on the heavy side, it handled like a dream thanks to its fully adjustable suspension. Helped out by the fact that it had 120 70 17s and 180 55 17 wheels, meaning you could get whatever kind of sport bike rubber you wanted on this thing. It has Brembo brakes and steel lines from the factory and it had a neat looking dashboard, which is nice considering you'll be looking at it most of the time. Brand new, the Grizo cost four. 14790 which is a lot, I mean at the price you're almost talking ZH2 money, but you can get your hands on one used for between 5 and 7 grand nowadays, which is a ton of bike for the money. The only issue with picking up a Gootsy is they don't have a very good dealer network, so you live out in the boonies, then good luck getting the bike serviced. Number 3, how about a beginner bike? The Suzuki Gladius. Look, I'll be the first to call the Gladius ugly, I mean it looks like it fell out of the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. It's something about the lines on the bike that I can't really describe, they're all swoopy and round, it doesn't 
look like a great motorcycle, and that right there is the reason the Gladius is on the list. For all intents and purposes, the Gladius is just a Gen 2 SV650, but no one would listen to Suzuki when they said it. Don't believe me? It's packing a 645cc, 90-degree V-twin, putting down 71 horsepower and 47 foot-pounds of torque. How about the SV650? It's a 645cc, 90-degree V-twin, putting down 75 horsepower and 47 foot-pounds of torque. The question you need to ask yourself is, is 4 horsepower really worth the extra money? I mean, you do have to co-sign on the looks of the motorcycle, which personally, I can't. I just, I look at it and I, uh, I can't. I, I can't do it, guys. Uh, I can't look at it. I'm sorry. But you know what? For a beginner bike, this is basically perfect. There's a ton of aftermarket support because, again, it's basically just an SV650. The knowledge base is there just like the SV. And in some ways, it's even better than the SV650. That literally hurt for me to say, but it's true. The dashboard has a big sweeping needle tack, which you know I love. It's got a slightly more legible layout as well. It's showing its age a little bit, but when you consider that the Gladius came out in 2009, you come to expect some of those dated looks. The best part is you can get a Gladius for as low as four grand from a dealership, and even less if you know where to look in the secondhand market, because let me tell you, nobody's buying these things. If you're worried about missing some of the modern features, don't be. The SV basically only has ABS, you're not mentioning that on much. Definitely an overlooked bike, again, if you can stomach the looks, which I really can't. Number four, the Honda VFR 1200F. Now here's for one of the sport touring dads out there who want a big stonkin' V4 to get them very effin' rigid. You see what I did there? VFR? Nah, you guys are no fun anyways. The VFR 1200F might be one of the ugliest bikes on this list, but you can forgive it for when you realize that it's a 1237cc V4 putting down a massive 170 horsepower and 95 foot-pounds of torque. That is not a typo. That is accurate. Oh, and by the way, you get that torque 90% off the line at 4,000 RPM. It's a properly fast bike and is actually something of a spiritual successor to the Super Blackbird. A lot of people consider the VFR 800 to be the little brother of the VFR 1200 considering they have the same nameplate, but they're really not. Putting the 1200 next to the 800, you realize that it's a gigantic motorcycle. It weighs in at 589 pounds and has a massive 5-gallon fuel tank that's so big it basically sits underneath your chin. It was meant to play with the likes of the Hayabusa and the ZX4 but it would only do 157 from the factory, so no one really cared. The thing is, it's actually a really good bike. You've got rebound and preload suspension, shaft drive, so no chain maintenance, and it didn't have VTEC, which means you didn't have to wait until you're halfway through the power band for things to start getting fun. A fun piece of trivia, the VFR 1200 was the first production bike to sell with a DCT transmission, so if you want to go stupid fast and have the bike shift gears for you, then this is the ride. Why you'd want that, I have no idea, but hey, it's there for you if you need it. If you want to get yourself a solid sport touring motorcycle with a killer soundtrack, you can pick up a used VFR 1200 for nine grand. Number five, it's the BMW S1000XR. Now I have a hard time figuring out exactly where I wanted to put this one because it's technically a sport touring bike, but it looks like an adventure bike from the front, a sport bike from the back, and a naked bike from the side. I think it's a deeply confused motorcycle about what it wants to be, and that confusion was translating to everyone forgetting that BMW actually makes it. That or because it's basically the most boring version of the most boring leader bike in the world. But hey, it's fast as hell, and that's good enough for some people. You got yourself a 9 9.99999 cc in line four because the Germans managed to squeeze every possible bit of volume out of their engines before hitting 1,000 cc's, and it puts down exactly to the thousandth degree a 165 horsepower and 84 foot-pounds of torque. We don't do decimals in our power figures anyway, but BMW managed to get them nice round because, of course, they did. The only mistake they made was not making the bike an even 500 pounds, tipping the scales at 498, but as it turns out, that's exactly what a soul weighs, so the more you know, I guess. It's got dynamic suspension, massive TFT dash, steel brake lines from the factory, a toll pass compartment in the gas tank, and a luggage rack system that only hose BMW motor rad gear, or the bike will take off and fly away because you're not good enough to ride this bike if you wear Icon gear. To be honest, this whole segment is pretty underrated, but considering it's swinging against bikes like the like of the Super Duke GT, it's no surprise the XR isn't the world's most popular bike. If you want to get one, you can have it for the low, low price of $17,945. Number six! The Suzuki Jixxus 1000, a bike so underrated even Suzuki forgot they still made it. The Jixxus 1000 has been giving Jixxer bros with back problems something to live for since 2015 with its K5 engine putting down 150 on horsepower and 80 foot-pounds of torque at the wheel. Yep, you can tell your baby mama that you're being safe because you got a standard motorcycle. Look, honey, it's so much safer because it's not one of those sport bikes, all the plastics, you see, and all those crash compilations. Little does she know it's packing the mother of all squid engines in there and you're still going out and popping dank 
tuners and flip flops and cargo shorts. The best part is that it's stupid cheap for what it is at 11,099 bucks. This is truly the people squid missile. And before you get on my case about how Suzuki just updated it for 2022, bro, it's all new, bro. You got to talk about the update, bro. They just put a Grom headlight on it and they needed it to look like a little like a Bionicle to be able to go head to head with the MT-10. As a fun teaser, we're actually going to be renting a Jixus Thou next week, so keep an eye out for that video. Number seven, rounding out our list of the most underrated motorcycles is the Kawasaki Vulcan 900. There, are you happy Vulcan 900 owners? I didn't just bring up the Vulcan to bash the 650 again. Look, it's on the channel. The 900 is a classic heritage cruiser, but unlike the garbage rolling dumpster fire of boringness that is the 650, the 900 is a V-twin, so you can actually sound like the Harley pirate you so desperately wish you were. It's putting down 50 horsepower and 58 foot-pounds of torque and weight in at 620 pounds, which means that it'll get you where you want to be, but probably not on time. It stops like it goes with a single disc up front, and the suspension keeps the bike off the ground. Now, it might sound like I'm being a little harsh, but while it's better than the 650, the 900 suffers from the same problem that all liquid cool Japanese V-twins do, and that's just that they're kind of nerdy. They've got three different versions of the Vulcan 900, and all of them are right around $9,000, but considering that the Rebel 1100 is $9,300 with a lot more power, a lighter weight, you've got to determine whether those classic looks and a V-twin sound is really worth the downgrade. Fact! There are 293 ways to make change for a US dollar. Goodbye. Hey there, partner. You done made it to the end of this here Yammy Noob video, but I tell you what, there's another Yammy Noob video right over here waiting for you. Now, I know I'm real gracious like that, and I just do nice things for you, so why don't you take a look at this video, and you let me know what you think.